Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, Pillow Talk this afternoon. My name is Brian Schaefer. I'm uh, a scholar in residence here at Jacob's Pillow, and it's a pleasure to be in conversation with our, uh, our panel today to discuss uh, some of the great exhibitions that we have hosted and are currently hosting here at the Pillow, and to talk about uh, the breadth of issues related to costumes, the, the aesthetics, the history, the politics, uh, and we have a great panel to help us uh, navigate those conversations today. And I'm gonna do brief introductions. Um, these are by no means extensive in terms of all the accomplishments of our, of our guests, um, but uh, very briefly so you know who's uh, on, the, uh, on the panel with us today. Uh, to my left, I have Caroline Hamilton. Uh, who is an historian and curator specializing in early 20th century ballet and the evolution of the dance costume. She holds a PhD from the University of Brighton and the Royal Pavilion and Museums Trust. She's worked with numerous ballet companies and designers on ballet reconstructions, including with American Ballet Theater and the Royal Danish Ballet, and has worked as a researcher and contributor on several books, including uh, Dance We Must, which is the, the catalog that we'll be discussing today and which uh, you can check out over here. We'll be talking a lot more about that. She's also worked on Anna Pavlova, the 20th Century Ballerina, and since 2021 has served as Jacob's Pillow's first costume curator after uh, spending many years here as part of the Jacob's Pillow family. So it's great to have you back, Caroline. And then next to Caroline is Kevin Murphy, who is the Senior Curator of American and European Art at the Williams College Museum of Art. He's also affiliate faculty in the graduate program in the History of Art and American Studies at Williams College. He's originally from Southern California and holds a bachelor's from Pitzer College and received his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara. So it's great to have you here and thanks for joining us. Then we have uh, Norton Owen, who I'm sure you all know. Uh, a, he's the Director of Preservation, has been since 1990 here at Jacob's Pillow. He oversees all programs concerning dance documentation, exhibitions, archival resources, and coordinates many aspects of the audience engagement services, including talks, programs, essays, and curating the Jacob's Pillow Dance Interactive, uh, which also currently is hosting a wonderful uh, complimentary essay and uh, multimedia exploration of our current exhibition. Um, so we'll be talking about that today as well. And Norton, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And joining us virtually, and we're so glad to have you in the room, is uh, Phil Chan. Phil Chan is the co-founder of Final Bow for Yellowface, which is an advocacy organization working with dance companies to eliminate outdated representations of Asian on, Asians on stage and to commit to more inclusion. He's also the author of the book, Final Bow for Yellowface, Dancing Between Intention and Impact, as well as the new book, Banishing Orientalism, Dancing Between Exotic and Familiar, which was just published earlier this year. He's an arts administrator and has held fellowships with numerous universities and institutions and was recently named a Next 50 Arts Leader by the Kennedy Center. Phil, thank you for joining us today. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. All right, so, um, so the conversation today is actually gonna span two exhibitions um, that Jacob's Pillow has uh, been a part of and helped sponsor, and uh, one of which is uh, is right behind you, and if you haven't had a chance to check it out, this is Fantasy Meets Reality, uh, which examines uh, a particular tour, the Far East tour of 1925 uh, that Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Chan uh, embarked on. And uh, we're also gonna be going back to talk about the 2018 exhibition, Dance We Must, the art and costumes of Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean, looking at the period from 1906 to 1940, and that's the new exhibition catalog that we have here. And, uh, and so we're gonna talk about these two exhibitions in conversation with each other. Uh, we have Caroline and Kevin, who curated the Dance We Must exhibition from 2018, and then Caroline worked with Phil on curating the Fantasy Meets Reality exhibition that we have here. And so today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the way that they respond to each other, the issues that they bring up, uh, and also some of the beautiful costumes that we have on display and, and kind of where they come from and what they mean. And so I think it would be uh, helpful for all of our panelists to, to situate us with how you came to the exhibitions, what was your 
entry point for the, the exhibitions that you worked on and, um, and how, you, uh, how you work together to, to create your various exhibitions. I will start only in terms of origin story because of course um, you can't have an exhibition if you don't have stuff to put on exhibit. And that's where I have made sure over the past umpty ump years uh, to bring these artifacts forward into the present. Um, a lot of the costume trunks, which Caroline can speak to more in detail, but we had trunks and trunks, namely like 30 trunks of costumes that were 100 years old that have been shuttled from one spot to another spot on the pillow grounds over a period of decades. Um, but until the exhibit happened in 2018 and the cataloging of the costumes in preparation for that exhibit, we really didn't have a good idea of what we had and we really didn't have a good way in which to keep that. So it has been these two exhibits chiefly, uh, as well as an ongoing presence for the costumes now that we have a special collections room that has enabled them to come to the fore. But I would love it if Caroline would talk about when you first came here as an intern and first became aware of these costumes. Yeah, so um, I first came to Jake's Pillar in 2017, as Norton said, as an intern. Um, and I knew these costumes were here. And that was one of the reasons I was excited to come work at the archive. Um, I've worked with historic costume collections all over the world. Um, so I used to, I was working in the reading room um, and then I would go downstairs and under this space you're sitting right now were, I think it was 33 trunks, these huge big steamer trunks full of costumes and I think as my sort of intern project I was allowed to open one and um, you know have a look inside and I was just absolutely fascinated by what was there. Um, in 1981 was it the... Um, Norton had been involved with a former um, Dennis Shawn dancer and a former um, uh, Jane Sherman yeah. and a former um, men dancer, Barton Muma, and they had actually gone through a number of the trunks and made notes and taken Polaroids. So I sort of went through all of that, and this is absolutely fascinating. And I even came up with a proposal of what we could do with these, but at that stage, there just wasn't really the funds. It's quite a big project to do. So nothing really happened. But then Wickmer came on board um, looking for an, um, an exhibition and knew about the fantastic archive here, and Kevin can talk more about that. But it was because of that that we were able to start the cataloging project. So that's what I was brought in to do. So I arrived in January 2018. January at the Pillow is very different from the summer at the Pillow. And I'm Let's from Australia. think about it for a moment now. I'm from Australia. I had never seen snow like that and I had never driven on the other side of the road. So it was very exciting <laughs> for me. Um, but I spent the first sort of five months, you know, going through opening each trunk and it was just incredible. Um, one of my favorite memories is opening um, there was a, a small series of trunks that had just Ruth St. Dennis's costumes and the amazing kimono that you see, that is exactly as it looked as it came out of the trunk. And as you can see, it's quite big and it just kept coming and I was pulling this thing out and it was just incredible. Um, so my work in the beginning was going through this enormous collection. Um, and at the same time, I began working with Kevin of what we could put in the exhibition. Um, so that's sort of how that began, and then since that time I've continued to be able to work with the collection on a slower uh, timeline, um, and the way that I've sort of moved forward with using the pieces uh, as primary sources and the stories that they can tell is really what um, has kind of progressed with the work I've done with Phil. Um, and I think that was really interesting because he, uh, Phil can speak to this too, but he'd not worked with objects as closely before, so that kind of brought my micro-focus of the objects to his broader focus of the context. And I really think that um, they, it com they complement each other really well. So perhaps, Kevin, you want to add? For us, it was, uh, we knew about the archives, and we also knew that Caroline was here and that there was going to be starting to be more cataloging of these, these materials, but that you know, there was a lot of work to be done. And I, as a scholar, love projects that look at archives that you know, haven't been processed, that are sort of that bring new things to, uh, to the fore, bring new things into the sort of scholarly discourse. 
Um, and I'm also a huge classical ballet fan. So um, I'd been to the Pillow and I'd kind of seen how magical it really is here. Um, so I thought, wow, it would be just really wonderful to sort of be able to unearth these materials, um, think about them in context for me of like other kinds of things that were happening both in the United States but also internationally right at the kind of turn of the century up through 1940 and think about the connections that St. Dennis and Sean had particularly to this kind of international group of modernist artists who were doing the same, some of the same things in, in the visual arts as Sean and St. Dennis were doing in dance. And so I thought there was just a lot of great sort of opportunities there. I also thought that the teaching potential um, was just like outstanding. Like there were so many pathways in for our faculty and for the museum. Um, and WIPA sort of tries to straddle often with our exhibitions things that have this deep scholarly focus but are also appealing to the kind of summer crowds that would also go, go to the Clark and go to, um, to Mass Mocha. So this seemed like, it, it was, this was like a sort of perfect thing to straddle both our academic work and our work as a kind of small civic museum which we sort of turned into in, in the summer. Um, and it was great, I commuted down uh, to the pillow basically daily uh, from Williamstown, which is uh, uh, yeah, which yeah. Is quite a bit, of, uh, quite a commute, and was able to see as Caroline said the, the pillow in winter, which is it, beautiful in a different way. Um, and yeah, there's like only one bathroom, and there's no food, and uh, <laughs> I kind of like eat lunch in my car. You know? um, but yeah, it was so it was wonderful. So we were down about six months working on this. I would be thinking about materials in one part of the archives. Caroline would be opening trunks in another, and you know we we'd say, oh, well, like, I just found this photograph. Didn't you just open? Didn't you just find this in a trunk? And so it was just an amazing way of working with material culture and uh, some of the visual legacy of, of these two people. Great, thank you. And uh, now I want to bring Phil in. And so we're going to kind of toggle back and forth between the two exhibitions. They span five years, and so it's not going to be a clean narrative, but we're going to keep kind of jumping back and forth to understand kind of the way that they responded to each other. So Phil, can you tell us how you came into the project? I understand that you were also here in winter for the Pillow Lab in, in January, so you have some experience uh, of the pillow in the snow as well. Um, but what, what brought you into this project and, and kind of what were, your, what were your interests in starting questions? I have to say Caroline is an absolutely brilliant historian and also an expert in not slipping on the ice in the road, so thank you for that. Um, I, I came through to, to the pillow really because um, a lot of my work with Final Bow for Yellow Face has been looking at how Asians have been historically portrayed on our stages and also to then create opportunities for actually a actual Asian Americans, API artists working in the dance field today. So as part of that, um, it involved doing quite a bit of research into Orientalism as a genre. So um, I started my, my work at the New York Public Library looking at about 100 Orientalist ballets from Louis XIV to today. Um, I just got back from a month in Paris where I was looking through um, the, the, the National Library system there and going through a lot of their archives at the Paris Opera um, and really just trying to understand when we set a story in a different culture or we put on a turban or a kimono and we try on other cultures and want to perform these other places, what are we actually doing and where does that come from and, and how does that serve the art form um, and how do we continue some of these traditions when we are not just performing for a Eurocentric audience, when we are performing for a global, diverse, contemporary 21st American society, which includes non-white people, non-Europeans. Um, so that's really where, where I came to. And looking at um, the pillow and how so much of Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean's and the Dennis Sean um, legacy, their marketing, um, the, the cultures that they profit off of, literally built the, the, the buildings we are sitting in and the spaces we're in, sort of using that Asian-ness. And so as we are, we are looking at um, you know, racial equity in general, where are, have the Asians come through in the past in terms of Jacob's Pillow? What was that history like? Um, and beyond the sort of Orientalism, what has been the Asian presence of the pillow. So that was sort of the where where I was coming from as in terms of curiosity and also how do we look at some of these 
um, subjects with a little bit more nuance. So you see at face value this sort of a white woman wearing um, an Asian garment and performing this Asianness, and you know the the gut knee jerk reaction is like, okay, well that's cultural appropriation. That's really inappropriate. Um, it's it's of course a product of his time, but like, oh my goodness, you know it, this is really offensive, and. Part of my work is digging a little bit deeper, is is understanding that there is a little bit more nuance to that. Um, it can be that and, yes, and. Um, and so in this case was using the objects in the archives to actually illustrate and tell some of these stories and also lead people to think more broadly about culture. How do we share it? How do we use it to empathize with each other, see each other better? What was happening historically when these dances were being made? What's happening historically now in this present time? Um, so all of those things, all of those questions can both pose, uh, you know, pose questions and answers from these objects in the archives, which I think is the, the sort of hallmark of a really interesting and engaging conversation um, that comes out of an exhibition like this. So um, thank you to the, the folks at The Pillow for, um, for hosting this, this, this conversation. All right, thank you. And to, to look back at the uh, original exhibition, The Dance We Must, um, in both the, the explanations of the exhibition and also um, in the essays uh, that are part of the, the book, The Dance We Must Catalog, um, you do kind of look at some of the, the complications um, and, uh, and the challenge of looking both kind of clear-eyed and critically at the, the artists and the time. So can you talk about those conversations that you had uh, mounting Dance We Must and the, and the way that you uh, brought that into the way that the work was presented? So we were really thinking, um hard about that issue and were particularly in the text kind of thinking very critically about the complicated legacies of Sean as a dentist, but also you know, wanted to get needed to acknowledge the you know, what they were you know, how they had changed dance in the United States and what they were doing. So it was this very sort of we wanted to walk a line where you know we weren't uh, we were not like shying away from the cultural appropriation. Uh, but we were also trying to sort of think about cultural pre appreciation as well, because I mean I think that like St. Dennis in particular really had a deep. She you know she studied at museums and she studied at libraries and you know she really was trying to get a sense as best she could as a non-academic as a non-scholar. You know, um, she was really trying to kind of understand what what she was basing her dances on um, in a way that you know I don't think is it wasn't you know it's not sort of trait, but it was very much of the time when. As a white person, she felt the normative position was that she could sort of do anything, any any culture, you know, any ethnicity was kind of available to her because of her position. Um, so I think that was really interesting. Um, what ended up happening during the course of the exhibition was that students, in particular, really only approached it from the angle of cultural appropriation, um, and the kind of nuances were very much lost lost on them, um, and. So we felt like we needed to do a series of conversations with faculty from dance and with people from the pillow and with students who were interested to try to sort of elicit some of those nuances and sort of move them from a sort of very kind of like knee jerk and, and very sort of like forceful push at the exhibition um, and wanted to kind of think about it more deeply. So that was actually really important um, and I think those the students who initially were just you know came to it with a kind of level of vitriol ended up through those conversations at sort of understanding what what we were doing. It was also very important to me because for me because um, yeah I mean you know people don't always read the text but people weren't reading any of the text so it was very much like and there were some really interesting design issues so the students were reacting in part because the exhibition was designed so beautifully. Um, and we had spent so much time kind of thinking about how we were going to display the costumes, how we were going to display all of the other material that we were bringing in. Um, we, you know, we spent a whole day wandering around here um, trying to kind of match um, uh, paint color to some of the oldest buildings on campus. And so that was the men dancers. You know, we used that, we used the color that was, that were, were hopefully reminded people of this place in that section of the exhibition. And we chose a very beautiful, very roof color for you know, the other part of the exhibition. Um, so it was this interesting kind of push-pull between the beauty of the exhibition and the complicated nature of these figures and what they, particularly St. Dennis and Denishon, were doing, thinking about 
the work of other, you know, the, the performances and the rituals of other cultures. Great, thank you. And, and so, and Caroline, I'm wondering if you can speak to the way that some of the, the questions and the issues that were raised um, by students and others who saw the original exhibition, how that also kind of inspired uh, introspection as well that may have led us down the path to also have this, uh, this current exhibition that also puts some of the issues that they brought forth more front and center in terms of the way that we're looking at the, the pieces and the history and the artists. No, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things for me on the, the first exhibition, so five years ago, is it all happened so fast. So I was brought in to catalog this collection. So I was learning about this whole, the whole repertoire and what was going on. And then um, initially I wasn't actually brought in to be a curator on the exhibition. That sort of happened. Um, so I was learning all this material. And as Kevin said, these pieces, you know, we're finding them, we're matching them. And it was really fascinating, but I didn't have the time to really take a closer look, which you'll notice is a theme in this exhibition, um, and to really explore some of these themes that were coming out. So since being the um, costume curator here, it's been really wonderful to actually be able to take pieces out, uh, less pieces. Um, if you saw the previous exhibition, there was a lot of objects. Here we just have four cases. Um, but that was one of the things that was so great about working with Phil. So the first day, you know, we came in, Phil had not been here before, um, and we kept coming up with these, uh, this constant theme of duality, that these things are beautiful and ugly, you know, problematic, and it was just this idea of authenticity and then fantasy, where you get the, the name, fantasy and reality. And as we kept having those discussions, we like, it's okay to be both, to feel both. And that was very much what had come through with the student reaction and then also other patrons' reaction. The portraits are beautiful. You can't deny they're beautiful works of art, but they can also be problematic and ugly in their content. The same with some of the objects. The kimono in there is it's all hand sewn. It was made in Japan at the Imperial Theatre. It is an incredible object. And Ruth St. Dennis looked amazing wearing it, but she is also a white woman in yellow face wearing that. So the fact that you can feel both those things, this beautiful and ugly, um, and this fantasy and reality, and that was what came through. So the fact that I was able to slow down, also bring in somebody else to really look at the costumes in a different way, and that was really great because I am very close focused. I, I have handled every costume item in this collection, which is two and a half thousand items. And I have you know, looked at them under a magnifying glass. I've sewn a label into every single one. So my focus is very close. You know, I'm like, look at this stitching, look at this seam. And Phil was saying, but look at this, you know, this con the context of it and taking a step back. So I think for both of us working together, I was able to take a step back and he took a step forward and we kind of looked at things in different ways. And I hope that comes through um, in the, the exhibition here. So in each case, we've tried to show an example of pure fantasy and an example of authenticity, where they're actually having objects, costumes made purposely in Asia um, and then other items which are just what they thought you know, a costume might look like in Thailand and it's just pure fantasy. Um, so that's really how it developed for me. It was really this opportunity to take a closer look and also bring in other voices. So. I think um, for you to say that, to speak about the, um, the clo looking close as opposed to taking a wider view mm -hmm. is also a wonderful thing in terms of the book uh, to bring that into the conversation because one of the fascinating things about the catalog is, that, is the details in that. I mean, much more so than you can even see for the ones that are on display unless you bring your magnifying glass with you. Um, no, absolutely. So. That, was a, that was a choice um, between Kevin and myself. We'd seen some other, there's quite a sort of theme in costume and dress history books right now to go super close. So you can't even see what the object is, but to really look in and then have the further back images. And I think that also complements then um, Kevin's essay, the other essays that are in the book as well. So, and I think for me it just, so we had the exhibition and uh, we wrote the book 2020, 2021, so that came out a few years later. And then for me this exhibition sort of brings the narrative forward and the collection forward as well. So. Thank you. I, I'd love to, um, I love the example that you just gave of the Root St. Dennis outfit. And I uh, love all of the panelists too. 
uh, maybe think about an item in either the, uh, the Dance We Must exhibition or the Fantasy versus Reality exhibition that just fascinates you for some reason, whether that be the craft of it, whether that be the issues that it brings up, whether that, uh, whether that be the discomfort that you feel that, that Caroline just spoke about. Um, so an, an item that we might um, have in mind when we look through the catalog or when we go look at the current exhibition um, that you can draw our attention to um, and we can look at it kind of through your eyes. Um, well, while Kevin and Phil are having a think about that, um, I think probably one of my favorite items is the headdress for Kuan Yin. Um, it's also one of the most problematic, I would say, items. So this is what she's wearing in the portrait and the actual headdress we have. And this was uh, a piece created six years before she set foot in Asia, so it is very much in the fantasy. But when I began taking a closer look, so initially I thought the headdress was just beads, it looks like the inside of your grandmother's button box, it's just all sort of a mishmash. But when I actually took the time to really look closely, um, it actually includes some elements that are authentic Chinese techniques. So she did actually try and find some pieces, probably from a Peking opera headdress, Phil and I suspect, that she repurposed for this. So there are imitation jade beads. If you look really closely, there's a, a blue flower in the center, and that is kingfisher feathers. Um, which is just incredible. So at first, I thought this was a pure theatrical fantasy headdress. And having originally been a costume maker myself, that kind of appealed to me the way that it's all just sort of uh, made together. But there's actually some intention behind it, and I found that really interesting to kind of wrestle with that. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also say, Kuan Yin, but I'm going to sort of say, I mean, one of the things that was really remarkable for me about the exhibition was working with both the costumes, which I really hadn't ever worked with before, and working with the visual art material that you know I was more familiar with. Um, so, as Caroline just said, you know, the costumes look very different now. They, you know, in some cases, St. Dennis used them for years and years and years and years, and then they were, you know, in trunks that were sort of moved around the pillow um, to kind of you know keep them as safe as possible, uh, and. So looking at those now, you don't necessarily see the kind of stagecraft of St. Dennis, uh, which you know, she, all critics kind of talk about how she was really amazing at using you know, different kinds of light, lighting gels and, you know, kind of, and creating a kind of image on stage that we really can't see anymore because the only color footage is, very, is from like the late 40s, I think, or even later than that. Um, so you know, there is color footage of her and her prime on stage. Uh, but looking at things like the two portraits, you do get a sense of how you know she was, she may have actually sort of looked on stage, um, and that is actually, and then that's one of the, these sort of push pull issues, because it's exactly what sort of what Caroline was saying about the kind of like the the portrait is so beautiful and so well done, but it has an ugliness, and it was that costume and that portrait along with the portrait of, of Sean um, in his Indigenous American, you know garb that were the two things that started the, the conversation with the students um, that I think was so fruitful during the course of the exhibition. Yeah, I think on, on Kuan Yin, um, you know, as a, as a Chinese person, she's sort of like the, the closest thing to a patron saint. It's sort of like the Virgin Mary and the sort of relationship that one might have with the Virgin Mary, you know, like a Catholic person, you know, and so that's how I'm coming to it. And so I have a very specific relationship with this, with this iconography. Um, but I'm also just thinking about what came before in terms of history, like we were moving away from Princess Gamzadi and Yam Yam from the Mikado and like all these sort of fantasy caricatured Asians. So she really did did her research and tried to find something authentic from the culture to portray. It's not Chinese dance, it's a product of her own imagination. But I'm just thinking about like what was the place of what of Chinese people in the Western imagination? What what did the normal person, American or, or European audience member, think of when they thought of Chinese people in the 20s and Chinese culture? So for her to show something that is more um, elevated, not like a coolie, but show a goddess, right? Um, in some ways would help show a different side of Chinese culture than what was available. Yet it wasn't really authentically Chinese culture, but maybe it piqued a curiosity. So having that blend of something that is authentic, 
and something that is fantasy um, is both problematic, but also might have opened some minds at the same time. So just being being able to be in that uncomfortable place where it can both be something constructive and something damaging in terms of how we represent it. Um, I don't know. Also, would we have um, a wider acceptance in the Asian community if it weren't for these white bodies legitimizing these forms, which were otherwise associated with sex work? You know, it, it's it's quite complicated to look at this history, and it isn't just so black and white. So I think um, these objects kind of of have that reaction, even as someone who has such a close relationship culturally with what is being portrayed in these dances. So that's been an interesting um, negotiation. I'd like to pick a different kind of, of favorite, um, something that's not in this exhibit, but uh, there is a, a costume that Sean wore in the Men Dancers era that is uh, that are trunks, basically, but they're very high-waisted trunks. I, this was at a point um, when Sean was fighting the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, so uh, wanted to, wanted to contain his girth. And so it's a very um, there. It's like gold threads, and it's it's very fancy looking. But underneath, if you look uh, at the back of it, you realize it's built on a corset. And the corset was Ruth St. Dennis's. It's written in it. Ruthie is in, <laughs> written on the, on the corset part. So, you know, I think it, it's a great illustration of how these things were costumes. I mean, they, they had a job to do. And they were utilized, really, as working garments, um, which I think is also the reason why we have them because it wasn't so much that Ted John thought, someday there'll be a museum exhibit. I don't think he had any clue about that. I think he, they thought, oh, well, maybe we'll use these for some time. You know, like, okay, we might figure out another way that these would be of service. Um, a lot of the costumes from the Denishon era were burned. There was, there's a very evocative description in Barton Mumaw's autobiography where he talks about how uh, at the final day of the Denishon era, when the Denishon house, which was a studio in, uh, in the Bronx, and it's where those portraits were first shown in 1925, but they were dividing things up. This was 1930 or 31, and uh, things that Ruth wanted, she kept. Things that Ted Sean wanted, he kept. And the things that neither of them wanted, they had a big bonfire, which is you know horrifying to think of now, but, uh, but thank goodness Sean wanted so many things because that's what we have here. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if the curators of these two exhibitions can just walk us through the process of, uh, of building an exhibition and, and what it takes logistically to, uh, to decide what you want to include, to physically prepare it, uh, to decide how you want to present it, to decide how you want to tell the story of the exhibition and what the various steps are to actually physically building it. Um, sure, I can start that off. Um, I'll probably give more examples of this one because it's right here and you can go and look at it straight afterwards. So this was, uh, Phil and I were here in January in a lot of snow um, and really it was, you know, looking at as many pieces. We were trying to find the story as well, what we wanted to say, what we wanted to talk about. And quite early on, you know, we'd come up with this sort of duality idea and we really saw this tour that they did to, uh, East Asia in 1925, 1926. It was an 18 month tour as a really fascinating entry point. Um, so then it was really looking at what pieces um, we had. So we looked at a huge variety of pieces. I think one of the things that is so unique about this collection as well, and um, so great about what Norton and Patsy have done here is that not only do we have the objects, but there are uh, photographs, there are programs, there is all the footage, you know, everything as well, all in one place is so unique. And I've very rarely come across a collection that's so complete like that. So we looked at a huge range of things. Um, and then it was also, it really came down to sort of logistics in that we knew we'd only have a very small amount of time to actually install it. I'm a one woman show when it comes to actually curating and putting up the costumes, or oh, I did have some great help um, from the interns and staff here. But it was what would be doable to put up, what is also stable, 
that's an important thing with anything uh, this old. These are really old costume items. Um, and although they look beautiful, they've, all they've had is some surface cleaning. There's no conservation that has happened. This is how they looked when they came out of the trunks. Um, but really what is safe to display and also the story. So what we could, so this took a, about a week to install. Every mannequin that you saw here and at Dance We Must is custom made for the costumes because these costumes were custom made for a body and that body is no longer there. So you can't just get a size, you know, six mannequin and put it on there. It's not going to work. So every mannequin has to be Customized, luckily, from Dance We Must, I made a lot of mannequins for that. So we have a younger Ruth mannequin, a slightly older Ruth mannequin. We've got a range now. Um, but yeah, that was really working out w the story that we wanted. So it was kind of similar to what we did for what Dance We Must, but on a much smaller scale. Um, and then, yeah, working on the, so a lot of the things like with panels and descriptions, we worked on remotely. Um, and then I was here about a week, I think, putting it all together. Um, Dance We Must didn't take a huge amount longer. I mean, we started that in January of that year and it was installed about the same time, um, which was very, very short for such a big exhibition. Um, so my role in that was purely the costumes. So there's about 35 costumes in that exhibition. Um, and Kevin worked on many hundreds of photographs and printed material. So you could probably talk a bit more about that. Yeah, so philosophically, like when I approach a project, I, I work from the objects and then I, the story sort of emerges from the object. So sometimes curators might work with an idea and then they find the objects. And that's, the, both are equally valid. Um, it's just that I tend to be an object, more very object focused. Um, so, um, but in the larger dance with us, we also knew that we wanted to tell more of a survey of, of both St. Dennis's early career, Dennis Sean, and then Ted Sean and the men dancers. So, um, the constraints that we were really working under were what costumes could be shown um, and then what other materials did we find that demonstrated how other kinds of visual artists were working with that material. So photographs, drawings, the paintings, and, and there are some other paintings as well. Um, so we really wanted to find we, you know, dances that had both the costumes but then a lot of other visual material were, that was related to it. So it was those pieces that really drove what we were going to be showing. Um, and so we did it basically chronologically from, from those. Um, and so that was a, it was an interesting constraint to be working with because there were some things that you know, we might have really wanted to show, but we just didn't have the materials for it. Or hadn't found it. Or hadn't found them yet. So I think that was really, um, that was interesting. So it was, it, we were trying to do much more of a kind of like a sort of overview um, but you know the threads that really wove through it were you know ideas around cultural appropriation, ideas around sort of the encounters in 1925-1926 that Dennis Sean had when they did the Far East tour, um, and then sort of Sean and the Men Dancers and the sort of you know homoeroticism of that company. Um, so there were you know, a number of sub themes that sort of ended up emerging through with that larger just sort of like trying to get a sense of. Who were these people? Why were they so important to American dance? Um, and how were they working in a kind of um, ecosystem of other kinds of artists, musicians, writers, uh, painters? You know, I mean, Ruth was, there's a whole suite of drawings um, by Rodin of Ruth that concentrate on her arm. So, I mean, yeah, they were working with John Singer Sargent. You know, they were working with like a number of really heavy hitting artists on both sides of the Atlantic. And we wanted to kind of surface some of that as well. And Phil, uh, was this your first time working on a, a visual art exhibition? And, and if so, kind of what was the process like for you in terms of uh, dealing with these, uh, these historical artifacts to be dealing in objects and images and, um, and to kind of take the, the work that you had already been doing and advocating for and to, uh, to engage with it through this particular lens? Yeah, actually, this is one of three exhibits I'm working on or that are opening right now. Um, I'm also working on an exhibition on chinoiserie at Drexel University. Um, we have about uh, 30 costume pieces, some porcelain, some furniture, some paintings that's really looking at um, several different themes around some of the many parallels. So authenticity um, and integrity, sort of appropriation, appreciation. Um, you know, how, how do we how do we look at some of these garments? How do we talk about them? Um, but yeah, I, I think just really being able to get up close and 
um, touch some of these pieces um, and just have that connection to the history. And as you're chewing on an idea and trying to figure out what what are we actually looking at to have that tactile experience and to actually handle primary sources, um, to actually handle the objects, it, it gives, I don't know, we're, we're like body people, maybe just as dancers, but like just having that tactile experience helps you really think about the objects in a, in a different way. Um, it's, I think, the same as, as you know, doing choreography. You know, you, you, you have a lot of ideas and then you have to just edit and edit and edit and, and, until it's really refined. Um, I love that, that there's this uh, Balanchine quote that he says that it's not perfect until there's nothing more you can add, but when there's nothing more you can take away. So just really distilling it down to what it has to be and what it has to say. So. Um, I think that process has been um, a lot of fun and, you know, a little bit like Sophie's choice at times because like all of these objects are so beautiful and they all have, you know, these these magical stories that really complement this larger theme. So um, I think that's been the challenge is that there's a finite space, but I, I would recommend folks check out the, the digital sort of supplement to the exhibition, which um, just, you can see a lot more of the objects that weren't able to make it into the show um, and, and have some conversation around that. So I think that's been... Um, just such a wonderful process. And, and I think it's just thinking too about what happens next um, after this exhibition. You know, Jacob's Pillow has uh, brought Asian artists from Asia since the 40s um, and really was an early pioneer for presenting classical Indian dance in this country. Um, so what does that continued commitment look like um, in the future from this institution that has been um, really both supported by and nurtured by uh, both fantasies of Asia and actual Asian artists. So, um, you know, would love to to make this more of a home. Well, thanks for that lead in, Phil. I will take that as my cue um, to read a, a statement that um, that Pam Taji wanted me to uh, share with you today. Uh, which goes as follows. Jacob's Pillow is committed to eliminating outdated and offensive stereotypes of Asians on our stages and working to increase the presence of Asians, Asian Americans, and other underrepresented communities on our staff and board, in our school, and on our stages. So I think um, what Pam is stating there is um, is a th thought that is very much brought to life in all of the photographs around us uh, in this gallery in particular, which represents artists from other uh, cultures who have been at the pillow, as Phil points out, since the 1940s. Um, and we're really happy that this exhibit, which we did a deep dive into just a few days ago in a pillow talk, uh, can be at the opposite end of our um, archive building in the same year, so that we really are looking at both ends of things to see what was done 100 years ago um, out of a sincere um, belief that all cultures were uh, to be celebrated and um, and and held up uh, for people to applaud, and um, and what has been done at Jacob's Pillow in particular from the 40s through to now, and the fact that we have a company from um, from Germany on our stage this week, uh, so that helping people, I think, to see it all of all part of one. Uh, in a sense, one um, motivation, and even you know, as complicated as it may be, uh, to in a sense see it under the heading of the title of this exhibit, which is welcoming the world. I also want to, to echo uh, what Phil was saying about the the dance interactive essay, which is really wonderful, and also. Um, it, there's some really, really amazing uh, videos that are uh, embedded in it that you actually see uh, sh uh, Sean and St. Dennis uh, on these tours, in these costumes. It really kind of brings to life the way that they were, uh, the way that they used them, the way that they presented them. It, it brings a lot of context to, uh, to both of the exhibitions and it's really worthwhile. And, uh, and also to follow up on Phil's uh, point about kind of moving us into the future now and, and what does it look like today and how do we apply it? Uh, there's also a, a quote from 
the, the Dance Interactive essay, uh, it says, while we can't accept St. Dennis and Sean's creative process as contemporary models for crossing cultures with integrity, looking at these objects with curiosity can provoke questions and discussions on the best way artists today can do so with grace and respect. And I know this is a big part of your work, Phil, uh, working with companies today. Um, how do you advise companies to, uh, you know, to, to approach um, cultures with, uh, with the curiosity and the responsibility that doesn't fall into the traps that we fall into in the past? I think right now, um, at least in the sort of Western focused um, art forms, so classical modern dance, um, classical ballet, um, there is, like a long history of presenting orientalist stories so like turbans kimonos just dressing up but uh, a lack of actual asian artists coming in and telling either their own stories on their own terms w around respecting you know how what sort of symbols to represent their culture or even just telling whatever story that they want to so um there's this historically this sort of false sense of diversity because look we have this story that takes place in India and a story that takes place in Germany and a story to, that takes place in Spain when in fact all of these stories were were created by you know often just a small handful of white guys from a hundred years ago so um, working with companies to say hey you're, you're doing a new production of Swan Lake what about hiring an Asian costume designer oh you're you're about to commission um, a new triple bill here's a list of Asian composers that that would would love to collaborate with any of the choreographers you're selecting um, so just starting to create more opportunities there um, I really do believe that um, the sort of next uh, driver of innovation and creativity is going to come from our diversity, is going to come from when we have slightly different perspectives of how we see the world and we can use that as a strength and as an advantage. Um, I think that applies to other areas in life, in, in business, um, in the military, um, just in society. I think diversity is a strength for us. So um, if I can work with someone who has a slightly different background than me, then to tell a better story, um, especially if we're crossing cultural boundaries with each other, I think that is so wonderful. And what a great privilege and responsibility we have as Americans living in um, a society that is, um, you know, pretty, pretty mixed. And um, so I think that's, that's that's the sort of larger takeaway, and what I hope people can can think more about is um, we don't want to have this cultural resegregation where you can't take African dance classes if you're not black, um, you know, because then we wouldn't be able to share with each other. Culture is meant to be shared. How how am I going to get to know you better unless you can come over and have some of my Chinese food, you know, and let me tell you about, about my family story and where I come from, um, and tell you some of my fairy tales. So. Uh, we need to be able to be more open, but we need to do it with more integrity. We need to understand the historical um, imbalances and, and sort of th that have prevented some folks from telling stories. So that's that's really where my advocacy is at, is um, just empowering other Asian artists of any discipline. Um, and this is through my work through the Gold Standard Arts Foundation, if folks are curious, but it's really this um, this umbrella service organization that emerged after the, after the shootings in Atlanta um, in 2001. And it just felt like the whole dance community turned to me and my co-founder, Georgina Pazgogan. And, and they were like, okay, what's the hashtag? What's the action item? What do we do? Um, and, you know, we were like, we're, we're just two people on a website just trying to get people to not do racist nutcrackers, you know? But then we looked around and realized that like, wow, we are the Asians, you know, there's other affinity spaces, Dance State of Harlem, Alvin Ailey, Ballet Hispanico, but like Asian folks don't have that in America. And um, while we might make up to 20% of, of a, a, a urban area, we are only 7% nationally um, as Asian Americans. So um, we have, and that encompasses many different types of people. So not just East Asians, but South Asians, um, Western Asians, Siberians, um, Pacific Islanders. This is like a lot of people. This is, you know, the majority of the world, but only represented by a small piece of pie. And we didn't have the infrastructure to support our community in times of crisis. So this is where this is coming from. It's saying, okay, well, you know, you posted that black square and you wanted to say that this ballet studio is belongs to everybody. Well, let's let's see these Asian choreographers get some jobs then. Let's see those composers get some jobs. Let's see some women get some jobs. So um, that's a big part of our, our advocacy. And then now we're able at this point to um, produce these all Asian choreography festivals around the country. So we're doing one at the Northrop um, next April and one at the Kennedy Center next June. Um, and these are all world-class American major ballet companies doing 
Asian choreography. So we don't have Balanchine, we don't have Swan Lake on the rep, it's just Asian choreography. So even though this art form came from Europe, we're able to use it as an expressive tool of who we are today in this moment. So um, that's, that's a direction that this exhibition is hinting at in terms of what the potential for this art form could be and how do we keep it alive for a diverse contemporary American society. Great, thank you for that. Um, I want to make sure we have time for some of your questions. And so if, if any of you have questions for, uh, for our panelists up here. Thank you. That, it was a comment about how inspirational the, the exhibitions were in terms of the way that they uh, told the story of Denishan, in terms of um, the way that they approached the topics and also the issues that they raised. So thank you for that. Are there any other questions? Can you, uh, can you tell us about how you translated the uh, Dance We Must into the catalog? What is that process like? So this, we have the catalog here for sale. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and, and just the way that you approach it so that it's uh, an added value to, to what you created, both as documentation, but also to continue to textualize it, um, to invite additional essays, to uh, kind of tell the narrative of, of what this exhibition was and, and what we can expect to find in the book. Sure, well, I can talk about my aspect, which is the, um, all the costume entries. So one of the things that I really took away from the exhibition, um, those of you that went to see Dance We Must, there was only about 35 costume items and there were several hundred photographs and printed material and artworks, but everyone's visceral reaction was with the costumes. And I found that really fascinating. There's something about being confronted body to body, mannequin to mannequin, you can't escape from that. When you look at a black and white photo, there's that distance, oh, that's the olden days. But when you're in front of the costume in full color, um, you can't get away from that. And that can make, you can be inspired, you can think it's beautiful, or it can make you very uncomfortable. So I really wanted to kind of use that and the power of how you can use costumes to tell these stories, to explore these uncomfortable themes sometimes, um, which is what we tried to pursue with this exhibition. But within the book, I really wanted to take a closer look at the object. So if you have a look in the book, there's a lot of very detailed photographs uh, to the point where you can't actually see what the object is. It's, it's really, really close detail showing the embroidery of the workmanship. And then also in the descriptions of the costumes, it's very much about these working objects. Those of you that dance know that your costume is part of you. It's a partner in your dances, especially in this era, like Ruth and Dennis and her costumes are very interlinked. They're, she often didn't um, alter them. You know, they stayed the same for like 40 years and were falling apart in some cases. But I really wanted to show that detail. Um, so throughout the book, there are, I think, uh, about a dozen uh, entries on specific costumes and you have the detail information explaining the construction, what you find inside, um, and also these detailed photographs. And then that um, goes through Kevin's much longer essay um, and some other essays as well. But for, for my part of the book, I really wanted to uh, use the costumes as a, an entry point into some of this discussion. So. Yeah, I think, so one of Caroline's earlier points, we were working really fast and um, we, there was, there ended up being so much more material than we thought, and it just sort of spoke to the richness of the archives here, and really just how much material there is, both from the Denishon era, and then also from Sean and the Men Dancers era, um, and we were just basically kind of trying to process, and then figure out how we were going to create a narrative in the exhibition, um, and it was very clear, I think, to, to, to all of us, that 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 you know, the, that there needed to be a more permanent kind of place for that scholarship to live, and a more sort of and for us to be able to do, as Caroline just said, more in-depth research, um, which we really didn't didn't have time to do. You know, it would be um, we did this we did an exhibition that should have taken about eighteen months and six, uh, and it just meant that there wasn't going to be time for a sort of more permanent thing. So I think you know the problem with exhibitions is that you, know, you work on them for as long as you work on them, and if there is no catalog, they just go away. And you know, some, maybe people will remember that they had a good time, but like, there will, the, the scholarship doesn't live anywhere. And the, the importance of this archive um, really needed that, a place for that. So we were always trying to you know, figure out how we could um, you know, get Caroline back in and contribute, and, how, and so we were able to get a really great um, grant from the Kobe Foundation 
um, which is a, a foundation that supports um, work in um, artistic work in textiles. Um, and that gave us the funds to, to finally do the book. And then it was the pandemic. Uh, so we were just sitting at home. And um, the, the, the bad thing was that we couldn't actually come and see the objects again. Um, so we had to rely on a lot of those, those, those great photographs and the kind of like memory in a way. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was really a place that we, you know, where we were able to surface things and we were able to have it now. And I think that it's, you know, I think what's great about um, the smaller exhibitions um, that like this, this exhibition that Carolina filled it, like we thought of Dance We Must as a kind of opening salvo in what we hoped would be lots more research and lots more entries and lots more people working on this archive and thinking about this collection and thinking about these two figures um, and thinking about American dance. And so the catalog was a place where we could continue that work. You know, it's, by, none of, it's, it's by far not definitive, but we hope that, it's, it, that it, it may um, serve to inspire, as you just said, um, scholars and others. Well, and I would say from the Pillows standpoint, that to us is one of the most gratifying aspects of this whole project. Uh, we're so thrilled that to have been able to uh, partner with WICMA um, and, and to make it happen in the first place but moreover to result in this catalog which now will live on. And the fact that people who didn't see the 2018 exhibit will have a chance, they'll have a window in to something. And uh, that, of course, that's the archivist's dream to make sure that, that your materials and that the story that you're trying to tell will continue. So uh, we thank you for that and hope that everybody will pick up a copy over yes. there. And so uh, I think now we'll uh, conclude our, our conversation and, and give you the opportunity to, uh, to check out the catalog. And uh, I wanna thank our panelists so much for, for participating, for sharing. Uh, Caroline Hamilton, Kevin Murphy, uh, Norn Owen, and Phil Chan, thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here.